All righty. Well, that being said, uh, I think this point we can turn over for our main program tonight. Um, we have this evening a uh, presentation by both Neon and, and Mike here uh, about portable operation, but I'll let them say a few more words to introduce themselves. I think Mike wanted to kind of say something to introduce him. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Go ahead. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Andrew. And, and uh, good evening, everybody, again. Um, so I was thinking about uh, this presentation a little bit, and, and Leon has done a wonder. He, he's done the lion's share of putting this thing together. So I, I think you'll really enjoy it. And um, um, uh, and for us, I think, and Leon, you'll have to remind me because I forget. I think this started probably six to nine months ago, and, and Leon was building an NFED half-wave antenna. And uh, he, he uh, said, you know, we really ought to take this out somewhere and try it out. And uh, so that evolved into <laughs> into uh, developing portable operations gear and operating portable, and we really need a structured environment. So why don't we try this parks on the air thing? And you know, sort of one thing led to another. And I, I will say, just uh, we, we have really had a blast. And and uh, our, I think our intention tonight is to uh, share the joy and uh, and. Uh, try to stimulate interest in you and let you know about another another area of amateur radio that is really, really fun. And I know some of you have, have done this for years, but for us, this has been a new thing and we kind of wanted to share the joy. So with that, I will turn it over to my partner in crime, Leon. So uh, yeah, thanks Mike very much for that. And um, uh, yes, we are gonna share uh, an activity that we've gotten engaged in. Uh, I think really our first uh, uh, portable operation was last spring and we were sitting beside the Potomac River and we were nearly frozen to death by the time it got done. <laughs> and, and it, and it uh, even though we were cold, we had a great time and, um, and we've moved on for them from there. So, um, so here we go. As Mike said, this is just something that's been an awful lot of fun for us. And um, not only has it been fun from um, uh, being able to get outside and so forth, but um, we've also built our capability in portable operations quite considerably. Um, and, and it's been good to do this in the framework of this organization called Parks on the Air, or POTA, as, as it's often called. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how the whole POTA system works. Uh, and then I'm going to let you know how to get involved <clears throat> either as a park chaser or as a park activator. Those are the two main activities in all this. And then uh, I'm just going to share with you our experiences in uh, how we do this, the gear we carry, uh, how we set up our operations, uh, the nuts and bolts of our portable operations, and uh, a little bit of safety and, and you know, how to take care of yourself when you're out in these parks. So uh, why do we like parks on the air? We've you know, kind of already said this, um, but for me, it allows us to do uh, two, three things that um, I really like to do. One is just to get outside. And uh, this is a picture of um, one of our activations early in the morning when we went out to Roosevelt Island. So there's a little bridge that goes across the river, and it was just a beautiful blue sky morning. The, you can see uh, Roosevelt Island on the right and um, somebody out in a skull there on the Potomac River, really nice. Uh, we get to see things like Great Falls. And then the places where we set up are really beautiful. This is, and, and actually not very far from home. This is a couple of photos that I took at Wolf Trap, and you can see Mike setting up there. You know, we're in the middle of the forest on a nice picnic table surrounded by pine, pine trees, and it just makes for a super great environment to operate radios, which, of course, is the second big fun aspect of this. So we get to be outdoors, and we get to operate radios, and we get to overcome some technical challenges. So uh, what, what's better than that? Um, the other thing that um, I've had the chance to do is, uh, for example, uh, last week we went down to visit my son who's doing an internship down in Brownsville, Texas, and so I threw a radio on my knapsack and um, uh, activated a couple of parks down in Texas. So uh, we wouldn't have seen these parks probably if I hadn't had an interest in um, doing some radio. So we visited the Port Isabel Lighthouse, which is right down on the water uh, in Brownsville, and uh, there I am in the picnic, and, and there's the lighthouse. And we also had a chance to um, activate this uh, Battlefield National Historical Park, which is uh, just east of Brownsville, Texas, which again, new environment and uh, something really fun to do. This this is where I operated uh, from. It was I, I was sitting in the back of the car and I had my antenna mounted in the uh, Texas scrub, which wasn't much more than uh, 15 feet tall tall at this point. So uh, it was a really it was a lot of fun doing this. So and and one of the things I think Mike and I realize as we do this that going into um, 
parks is, is kind of like what Forrest Gump said. It's a little bit like a box of chocolates. You never really know what you're going to get until you get there and, and look around. And that, that's what brings the, uh, kind of some of the interesting technical challenges to this. So, uh, a lot of fun to do it. And, um, uh, it, we, we've really enjoyed it. And so, and this just gives you a little bit of a flavor of, uh, of what we hear whenever we're doing this. USL, Whiskey Delta 4 Alpha, I copy 5-8 into North Carolina, you are 5-9 into Park Kilo 0692, enjoy your weekend, 73. Thanks so much, have fun. This is Kilo Delta 4, Mike, Mike, you are Zed. So, and at the very end, um, one of the really fun things about this is, if you caught it right at the very end of, of the little video I just showed, is um, we're, we're Rare DX, and we have pileups where, um, like, like you would not believe, and, uh, you know, having, having a, having a pileup to work on most of these uh, activations is uh, another one of the real joys and, and fun parts of all of this. So, uh, you know, we just have a great time doing this. All right, let's see if I can get this get this to move on. <clears throat> now, one of the other things is, is in addition to having pileups to work, uh, this is a map that shows uh, the contacts that uh, Mike got. Uh, he did a solo operation in um, uh, Prince William Park, and he was there for just under two hours. And this map shows the QSOs that he successfully made. It was um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 190 QSOs, and uh, you can see most of them were in the U.S., but uh, he reached as far as uh, far west as Alaska and and worked uh, several European stations during this activation. So uh, just in a short period of time, there's a lot of QSOs and, and a lot of fun. This next uh, map shows a blown up map of the U.S. So you can see that Mike's QSOs were primarily in the eastern half of the U.S., but um, uh, lots of QSOs all over the place. So, again, a lot of contacts and a lot of fun as we do these. Okay, so let me roll on next then to talk a little bit about the Parks on the Air organization itself. Um, and I got a lot of just really wonderful things to say about um, how the how the folks uh, who run this program have put it together. They have done just a fantastic job of, of getting this system organized, uh, setting up very friendly websites that uh, make it a real joy to, to work uh, uh, this Parks on the Air program. So it's a 501c3 uh, organization and their, their reason for living is to encourage portable operations from state, provincial, and nationally managed uh, public lands. And um, uh, it's uh, operating in it is, is very easy. It's, um, they, they set it up to be really simple. So they, they have a code of conduct, and if you read the code of conduct, the, the thing to remember about it is simply it, just be nice. If you're nice, that's, that's what they want you to be. And uh, there's just a few rules that you need to follow in order to participate in it. And I'll, I'll talk about those rules in, um, in just a second. They're really easy, which, which makes it a lot of fun. Low pressure, lots of fun. Um, POTA has a very large set of references, entities, or what you know, the parks, that's the P in POTA, that, um, uh, that allows you to um, be, be activators or you can chase the parks and, and you can do both if you want to. And uh, like I said, they've done a great job putting all this together. All right. Oh, and the, the other thing is if you want to find out more about this, this website that I mentioned to you, the place to get started is the uh, parksontheair.com. Um, and if you just do a web search, park, uh, Google search Parks on the Air, you'll find it. Okay, so how does, how does this whole process work? Um, well, there's two categories of operators in Parks on the Air, uh, similar to some of the other programs. There's the so-called hunters, uh, hunters or chasers. And um, they're out hunting and chasing folks who are in parks who are uh, activators. And so the, the idea is that hunters find folks who are in parks who have activated the park. And um, you work these little QSOs. They're pretty low key. They're friendly. You have sometimes have a little chat with folks and, uh, and you move on uh, as you work the pile up. And um, the hunters and chasers work as, as many activators as they can. And then the other thing we like to do is that if we're in a park, 
and we hear another park out there, we try to work park to park. So there's uh, an award system that's set up for park to park contact. So uh, when we're out activating uh, parks and we hear somebody call park to park, we tend to give them priority because we like to work them as well. So this is all about hunters and chasers and, and activators. And um, that's uh, that's the program in a nutshell. Um, if you're interested in POTA, uh, a really easy, great place to start is hunting parks, and it's really easy to do. So if um, you think you want to get started on all this, uh, the best thing to do, again, is to go to the Parks on the Air website and look on the menu for uh, a section that's called Active Spot. So you see this here. Um, uh, they, they post a page that shows all the stations that have either been spotted somebody or who spotted themselves or who indicate they're going to be in a park. And what you can do is you can search for activators by the um, uh, you can filter the, this um, uh, active spots page by things like the mode, uh, by the band that you want to work. Um, and uh, you can find out who's on the air and who's off the air and so forth. But let's say that you're set up on 20 meters and you want to work sideband stations. You can set the filter and uh, you can see the stations. You can tune them up. And, of course, if you can hear them, you can try to work them. Sometimes, like I said, it's a pretty big pile up and it's a little bit tough to get through. But um, this is this is uh, your opportunity to work um, uh, work those activate uh, work this, the, the parks that have been activated. And a nice thing to do is if you work somebody is to hit the respot button and uh, to let folks know that the uh, park is still activated and you can put a little note um, if you're in Virginia and you heard them in Virginia, other folks like to know where they're heard and so forth. And um, so, so that's, that's a helpful and nice thing to do as well. And then that's it. Um, you don't have to do any more if you don't want to. So, um, and and if, if you don't want any credit, but you just want the pleasure of going out and chasing parks and maybe putting it, putting them in your logbook, um, you know that's fine. You work the station and you move on to the next. There's no requirement to log anything or or whatever. But um, it also turns out that there's a lot of awards for uh, folks who are um, uh, chasers. Uh, but in order to get those awards, you need to register with the Parks on the Air system. And But again, that's a very easy thing to do. Uh, it's no cost. Again, you can find out how to do this on the Parks on the Air page. And uh, you can sign in with uh, your social account if you're interested. Or if um, you want to establish a new, a new account, you can do it with your name and email like most places. And uh, no charge to you. You just get registered. And then once you're in the system, um, when you work in a, a station, the activator will get your call in, in their log. And then when, and I'll talk about it in a minute, when they submit their log, if your call sign is in the log, it goes in the database. And uh, then you automatically um, get um, uh, locked in so that you um, uh, can begin uh, earning the awards. And then when you have an account, you get an account page. So this is a, a picture of a, a screenshot of uh, my account page that I did recently. And uh, if you're just a hunter, what happens is your statistics are gathered in the parks hunted page. Um, you can see here as a hunter, I've got 121 parks. And um, I've got down here, there's um, some more records of uh, more detail about the, the uh, references that I've hunted. So you can see that I've done uh, a 10 in Indiana and 14 in North Carolina and et cetera, down, down the, um, down the pathway here. And then nice little block diagram that shows the, the states that I've worked. So I've worked about 30 states so far in the, um, uh, in this program. It also has statistics for activators, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. But anyway, if you register and um, that's all you have to do is once you're registered, all the rest goes to the activator. The activator uh, will submit uh, their logs. Uh, your information will go in and you'll automatically begin to collect um, records of contacts uh, for which uh, you can get awards. And there's a bunch of different awards, just some examples here. These are, um, as I started out, you know, <laughs> whoopee, I got my first award at, 
at uh, 10 contacts, but um, pretty rapidly the, the, the awards build up. Here's one for 30 contacts. Here's one for 75. And then once you get up into the realm of 100 contacts and more, I don't know where they come up with these names, but uh, they're nice awards with nice certificates that you can print out and hang up on the wall. And again, they all come through automatically through the system. There's no charge to you to do these. You can print them up and, um, and post them in your shack if you want. So, Ron, we could, we could get many more pages of awards up on your wall if, uh, if you're interested ultimately in doing this, so adding to your collection. So that's the story on hunting. Really easy to do, lots of fun. And um, uh, as we've activated parks, which I'll talk about in just a second, we've gotten to know a fair number of hunters. And uh, so we're just getting to be friends with folks out there, and, and it's, uh, it's really a lot of fun. So um, once uh, you've uh, gotten yourself pretty grounded in hunting, you may uh, scratch your head and think, well, gee, maybe I'd like to get out and enjoy the outdoors and do a little bit of portable operation. How do I go about doing that? And um, it's again, it's it, 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 it's a lot of fun to be able to do. And I, I'm hoping that I can show you that it's uh, it's not terribly complicated to do. So so here we go. Um, the activations take place in state and national parks and wildlife areas, and the official listing of the parks that you can activate are found on the POTA website again, uh, that same the same website that I've been referring to. And the, again, the rules are really simple. When you set up, you just have to make sure that all of the components of your station the radio, transmitters, the antennas, and anything else that you use in your station are within the boundaries of the park. And uh, usually that's not too big a problem, but I'll show you an example of that lighthouse um, activation where the space that was available was pretty small, and uh, but I managed to squeeze it in without um, putting the antenna in anybody's way. So it, anyway, it's important to keep it within the, the boundaries of the parks. And then what you need to do to get an official activation, to get credit for activation, you need to make 10 simplex QSOs within one day. And, and those contacts can be on any band for which you're licensed and any mode for which you're licensed. So you could do slow, 10 slow scan TV contacts if you wanted to, and they would still count as a park activation. And uh, But generally, uh, it's a single side band, a CW, or some form of digital. There's a fair amount of FT8 activity that's going on out there. So those are the, the most common modes that are used. And um, typically when you um, have a QSO, again, it's pretty simple. It's call sign, you exchange a signal report, and uh, often the state uh, in which you're operating. And it turns out that some of the national parks, like if you get out um, uh, Harper's Ferry, for example, you can be in the national park out there, either in West Virginia or Virginia or Maryland. So it's important to let the um, hunters know uh, where you're at and uh, to put it in your log so they get credit for the, the correct, the, the, the right state in, in which you're operating. And then when you're done, um, the requirement, and it's really important for activators to do this, is to submit their logs in uh, ADIF format uh, to the uh, parks on the air. There's, there's call area coordinators for each of the AWR, or, or a, each of the uh, U.S. call sign regions. So one for region one, one for uh, all of them. So we have one for region four. Um, uh, my call is NT8B. So interestingly enough, I, I send my all of my POTA logs to the um, eight call region coordinator, who's a, who's a nice guy named Mike in Michigan. So uh, Michigan Mike takes all of my logs and, uh, and feeds them into, into the system. So, and again, it's really easy. There's a format that you use to send it in and all the information on how you do that is in the POTA website. So uh, where are all these parks? So um, as I already mentioned, there's a map system on the POTA website. And uh, when you go to the map page, what you see is um, a map page that looks like this. And all of these yellow dots are the, um, the parks that uh, you can activate. And uh, we're really lucky here in the D.C. area. If you just look at the circle here, this, this circle is you know 25 or 30 miles. There are a lot of parks in the D.C. area to activate. And um, most of them have been activated, but uh, they're, they're, they're parks that people are still trying to get. So um, the hunters and chasers are, are really anxious to, uh, to work us here. So, you know, uh, Wolf Trap, for example, is about five or six miles from my house. So I can do an activation with a, 
a 15 minute drive. So that, that works really well. And then the other thing to point out is that, you know, not only does this happen in North America. So, you know, we, we work a lot of Canadian contacts and, and of course, U.S. contacts, but it, it's international. I, I clipped a section of the map uh, from the UK and you can see there's a lot of parks in the UK and um, uh, got a few parks here in, in the Netherlands and in Belgium. So it is, it truly is an international activity. And um, so uh, once you um, then look at an area and you zoom in on it, so that's what this next slide is. So this is a zoomed in uh, on the DC area here. And, and again, you can see that there's a lot of parks uh, just uh, in the district itself. And then what I wanted to do here was zero in on um, uh, uh, Roosevelt Island that we activate a little bit earlier. And um, if you put your cursor over the little yellow dot, uh, this little window pops up and then if you click on more information uh, it takes you to a page that shows um, uh, interesting information about the site itself so you know where it's at latitude and longitude what what state it's in uh, when it was first activated how many activations have been so if you're a data geek these uh, these pages are really interesting and uh, then it comes down here and shows who who the um, park leaders are. So so this one station here, for example, KB1 HQS has activated the park 20 times. So been to Roosevelt Island for 20 activations and by by far and away as the big leader there. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but um, the actually the, the, the here the total number of uh, QSOs that one activator has done is listed here. So. Uh, this station that has done it 20 times has a total of 459 QSOs from, from the park. I didn't realize it on the day that I would end up being the number five activator here. So what we had a hundred, I had 123 QSOs in the log. And, uh, so I ended up uh, number five on the list here. And then, um, it, so this is for cumulative activations uh, and the, and then it has uh, data for the hunters. So remember I was talking about the hunters. If you, uh, work these parks on multiple times, um, this call station or this, this station here, KM4, uh, VEN has, has worked, um, Roosevelt Island 29 times and so forth. So, so there you go there. And, and again, I didn't realize this when I clicked on the link, but, um, I have 122 uh, QSOs from the island, so that makes me number two. And Mike uh, took took a little break and and uh, got behind by a few QSOs, but he's number three from Roosevelt Island right now. And of course, this changes all the time. And um, you know, this this uh, these kinds of data add a little bit of spirit of competition to this as well. But uh, again, it's it's much more fun than than it is competitive, really. But if you're interested in statistics and so forth, it's kind of fun fun to look at all this stuff. Um, another thing I want to point out uh, is illustrated on this slide here. Again, this is in our area. This is uh, shows the Conway Robinson Memorial State Forest, which is uh, west of us here. This is I-66 and 29, so so you know it's not far away. Uh, so Conway Robinson State Forest, you see here. And then uh, this little yellow dot refers to the Manassas National Battlefield Park. So this is a national park and a state park. But if we come over here to Bull Run Regional Park, you'll see that there's uh, no yellow dot here. And um, the reason I put this slide in here is just wanted to point out that um, POTA has drawn the line at national parks and state parks. Um, city parks and regional parks are not included in the database because there's just simply too many for them to manage. So um, if, if you want to know what, uh, if you're at a park and you want to know whether or not it's activatable, it's, you really need to go to the POTA website and look for the uh, magic yellow dot. And if it's there, you're in business. Uh, if not, then uh, uh, the POTA team won't recognize the activation. So, um, but there's plenty of parks out there as, as you can see. So, um, so with that in mind, how do you how do we activate these parks? And and I think that um, one of the things I would say is that um, you can do it in a really straightforward way with um, really simple radios, and um, you can actually have quite a bit of success um, doing this. So uh, let me give you some examples of the of the things that that we're doing. So one of the um, Sort of the general approach that Mike and I have taken to this is that we we want to keep keep our operations really simple, 
And we want to be able to set up uh, with one trip from the car to the picnic table if, if that's where we're going. So uh, we, we don't carry a lot of stuff and we try to keep it fairly lightweight so that it's easy for us to grab and go and activate a park without, without too much fuss and so forth. So uh, this is Mike's kit here when he's ready to go and uh, he can sling the backpack on his back and grab the battery box and um, head from the back of the car to uh, wherever it is where we're, we're going um, in the park. Um, here on the next slide are the contents of the pack. So uh, basically you need a radio. Um, there's a power cord here that goes into the battery box, which is right here. Um, we, we use a, an antenna that uh, tunes, with, it doesn't need a tuner on uh, 40 and 20 meters, which are, are the bands that we most commonly operate on. But we typically travel with an antenna tuner just to um, uh, tune things up a little bit, a little fine tuning if we need it. Um, if we want, we can operate, and, and I'll show you a slide in a second. Uh, Mike is uh, set up to operate digital here, so we could do FT8 um, activations if we want to. Uh, this is our simple little in-fed half-wave antenna, which easily fits into the bag, and then we have the hookup cables and so forth. And then again, I'll show you a little bit more about this in a second, but um, the, um, the far end of the antenna, we usually hang from a tree and uh, the way we get the rope in the tree is to use an arborist weight and an arborist line. And uh, that works just perfectly adequately to get the uh, get an antenna up in the tree and and make it useful for the POTA operation. And then um, there are occasions when we need a little bit of just a couple of extra items to be helpful. So uh, we also typically carry with us a fiberglass mass that's a telescopic mass that we can use to um, raise the far end of the antenna, antenna up when we when we don't have tr some nice tall trees around. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, sometimes we need something to sit on. So we carry these uh, really light three legged uh, stool chairs. And, and then we have a little portable table, uh, which, which makes um, operating, excuse me, makes operating a little bit more comfortable. As far as radios go, um, if you uh, trawl the websites or look at the YouTube videos, you'll see that just about any radio that can be put in the back of your car and then taken out and put on a picnic table and plugged into a, a battery will work. So there's um, all manner and, 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 and sizes and types of radios that are used. Some people will grab their 7300s or their FT dx 10s and uh, put them on a table they get uh, 100 watts out of them um, they're pretty big and they're a little bit bulky and and they sort of violate the spirit of our one bag rule so uh, the radios that mike and i have been using um, that give us 100 watts out is the uh, ft891 and there are some predecessor versions to this radio but nice. we've we found our 891s work really well for us um, if you're interested in qrp folks are using the uh the little uh, lower powered uh, qrp yezus the f uh, the ft um, 817s and 818s. Um, they not only have HF, but they also have UHF and VHF. So they're quite popular out there. And then folks are using the Elecraft radios and the, um, you hear folks using the, um, uh, ICOM 705s, their, their new QRP rigs. And then there are some Japanese, uh, QRP, uh, or 10, 10 watt or so output, uh, rigs. Uh, that folks are using. And then uh, some of you may be interested in backpacking and, um, and and you hear about folks using these little mountain toppers that uh, literally run off a nine volt battery. And, and this is just an example of a QRP labs radio. And, and I put these up here not to endorse any of these radios, um, but but basically just to give you some examples of, you know, what what we hear folks are using out there and uh, and just want to say it, it, it you don't it's not get, whatever radio you want. If, as long as you can power it and hook an antenna up to it, it'll work. So um, the, if you've got a radio, I encourage and you want to do this, I encourage you to get out and do it uh, and, and just do it. Um, so this is our setup here. Um, we have the we use the FT891 as I mentioned. We we typically will uh, use a, an antenna tuner for fine fine tuning of our antennas. Um, 
We both use laptops for logging. The power is plugged into the battery, so the battery is off to the side. And then I'll show you a little bit more about uh, the antenna in just a second. And so, so that's it. That that's all we use on the table. Um, Mike and I did a, another little Boy Scout event. It, it didn't happen to be a Parks on the Air event, but I just wanted to demonstrate that you know we can be out in the boondocks operating on batteries and um, and run FT8 as well. So uh, it does work, and and uh, it works quite nicely. Uh, this is the setup I used when I was in Texas a few weeks ago. I have a, a KX2, an Elecraft KX2. Uh, I have, this is my laptop. It's a little Microsoft Surface. And one of the reasons I like it is that uh, I've got a power cable that'll plug into my battery pack and it'll keep the computer charged up. Uh, but all this stuff fit in a backpack that um, uh, easily fit under the uh, airline seat where I was traveling. And uh, I was able to put all this stuff uh, in the bag, and I got it through the TSA without any problems. I didn't want; they didn't ask me to take anything out. It just went rolling right through, so I didn't have any problems with any of the stuff that I had in my bag. Um, so, in addition to the radio, I got a little CW key here that I use for the CW operations microphone. Uh, I do have this little uh, fiberglass mass. It's really not terribly strong, and it wasn't terribly useful for me, but I had it along anyway. I got a little container for extra bits and bobs. That's my antenna and that's the feed line and that's it. So the whole thing just fit really nicely into my backpack and I had a totally, totally portable HF operation that I was able to use in the field. So um, as far as antennas go, so you need to have a radio, you gotta have an antenna. Um, the antenna that we're using, as Mike mentioned already, is the NFED half wave antenna. I talked about this. Uh, in a in a presentation I gave a few months ago, uh, this thing works really well for us. Um, I have to say, I'm really surprised that um, it works so nicely. It's easy for us to set up. It works. Uh, it's cut uh, uh, for a half wavelength on 40 meters, and uh, it tunes up very nicely on uh, 20, uh, 40 meters, 20 meters, 15, and 10. And uh, it, it's it's got a big reach, and um, and we we really like how it works. Um, I, I won't talk about it tonight, but if anybody's interested, um, I can uh, help you make one of these things. You can make one for about 10 bucks. Uh, I pre printed out the winder on a 3D printer and uh, wound. This is a 49 to 1 transformer um, with, uh, with, with, with two toroids in this case. These are um, uh, FT240s, um, 100, uh, F FT, uh, sorry, FT14043s. I have two of them stacked here, and, and, and they, they just attach to, um, in this case, uh, an SO239 on the winder. And then uh, this wire that's on here is cut for the half wavelength on 40 meters, and then I have a little plastic carabiner here on the end uh, that you'll see in a second how, how we attach it and raise that far end up. And then um, what we do most of the time is most of the parks around here have nice tall trees, so we just use an arborist throw weight and, and the arborist line and uh, toss, toss it up in a tree. And uh, so in the next slide, we'll give you a demonstration on how this works. And I ask you please not to pay any attention to uh, what Mike <laughs> is saying about the uh, knucklehead out there who's um, uh, throwing the rope in the tree. But this is how it works. And, and you'll see it actually works pretty well. Here we are at Clara Bart National Historic Site, where Leon Bruner, famous antenna placement expert, is throwing his first line up in the tree. And of course, as always, First shot, best shot. <laughs> so anyway, um, Florid analysis uh, aside, uh, we, we have both, uh, with practice, have learned how to heave the, this arborist weight up in a tree, and we're, we're easily able to get a line up 30 to 40 feet, which is very, very suitable for the end-fed uh, antenna. And then uh, we just hook the carabiner onto the uh, end of the antenna and haul it up in the tree. And then the feed line for this is uh, it nearly, we've tried a lot of different configurations and, and they all work really well. So this is one example of, of where it's just, uh, the, this is the feed line for the antenna here. And uh, sorry, the antenna wire itself is here. This is the feed line attached to the socket on the, um, uh, on, the uh, on the mount. And it's, uh, the other end is just tied to a, a nearby tree. 
in this case, we just wrapped the feed line around the tree to hold it. Probably not great practice, but it worked okay. Um, here's when we were out uh, at Bitter Lake. I, I like to use these. Um, these are uh, portable electric fence stakes, and they have a nice sharp pointy end and a little footstep, so you can just uh, stick them down in the ground. So this was right next to the lake, and the feed line came across to uh, where we were working on a picnic table. That worked fine. And then, you know, we found that we can violate all the rules that um, you're not supposed to break when you're operating. We didn't really have any place to put this thing, and so um, we just hung it in a bush and, and the wire came out the other side and it worked perfectly well. We got a ton of contacts at, uh, on this part. And then this is an example of a uh, sort of tight quarters that I mentioned a few minutes ago um, when I was in Texas. So this was this little lighthouse in Texas and the lighthouse itself was framed in by this little narrow fence. And uh, it was nice that there was a picnic table here in the park uh, in this tree here. So uh, what I did was um, I uh, went to the other side of the tree and I used the arborist weight to heave a line, um, not into the branch, but all the way over to the top of the tree. And then I pulled the um, uh, antenna wire literally through the tree up to, and you can see it right here, we, we stopped at Lowe's on the way out to the park and, and bought one of these things because it's got a, I didn't carry it with me because it's got a nice spiky end on it. And I knew the TSA wouldn't let me carry it on the airplane. I'm sure they would have um, concluded it was a suitable as a spear. And so I, I wouldn't have been able to take it um, on board the airplane. So we just bought one when we were there. They're about four bucks. And uh, anyway, stuck it in the ground here, far enough away from the sidewalk where the public was going. And then the, the uh, antenna wire was just looped over the tree. And uh, you can see here, this is the, um, the winder where the transformer is, again, just suspended in the tree branches. And this is a close-up of it the other way. So, you know, not very suitable conditions, but um, I still active, successfully activated the park. So it took, took a while. The QSOs weren't rolling in like they usually do, but, but I was still able to uh, get a successful activation. And then uh, Mike and I have been in situations where there are no tall trees. So this is where the um, the spare mast comes in handy. So what Mike did here is he um, took his mast and, and we attached the um, the end fed wire to the mast and raised it up and then bungee corded the um, the mast to the tree, which was uh, out in the yard where we were uh, where we were setting up. And again, this is the uh, electric fence post um, just stuck into the ground and the feed line going back to where we were operating. Here's another example where the, the feed line has been bungee pulled to a fence post. And then lastly, I was out at a park and um, the nearest trees were on the other side of this line of brush and I didn't want to climb through the brush. It's it's really uh, that you'd be amazed how easily the feed line gets tangled up in this kind of stuff. So again, I just used the, um, the fence posts and I have a lightweight mast and I attached the feed line. I, I stuck it in the ground and attached the, the far end of the antenna to the end of the mast and just raised it up and, and operated from the edge of the clearing here, um, uh, with the mast attached to the pole. And, um, again, just to give you an example, this was a, a little experimental trip, I, uh, the trial run that I did before we went to Texas, I wanted to make sure that my little QRP operation would work. And these were the, um, the I think there's 19 QSOs that I got uh, on CW here uh, with with that NFED antenna on that mast um, in, in the clearing in the park that I just showed you. So so this this really does work quite well for us. Um, if you don't want to roll your own antenna, there are tons of uh, commercially available antennas that are available. I've just picked a few examples to show you. Uh, there's Par N Feds, um, which uh, is available from the Vibroplex folks. There's a bunch of different models of um, commercially available N Fed half waves. Another real popular uh, producer of um, antennas for portable use uh, is this company. Uh, it's an, a little small business uh, that's called Pactenna. Uh, he makes N fed half waves, he uh, makes random length uh, N fed antennas and um, linked dipoles and so forth. And, and they're, they're all made to be very easily portable. Um, another very popular antenna that's uh, used by the Parks on the Air folks are, is made by a company called Wolf River Coils, uh, and they, they have numerous different models of, of those that are available, and um, you, you can see a lot about them on YouTube. Soda Beam antennas are used, and then 
uh, buddy pole, uh, buddy pole, buddy stick antennas are really, really nice. They're, they're made of uh, pretty solid materials and it's their, their, their kits are really nicely put together, but, uh, they're quite pricey. And again, these, I'm not endorsing any of these. I, my homebrew antenna works great. And that's the one that uh, we've used for most of our activations, but I wanted to put these up here as examples of antennas that I'm aware that other folks are using very successfully for their park activations. So um, that's antennas. Um, being out in the field, you need some power. And um, again, it's not rocket science. Um, you can get away with some pretty small batteries. Um, we, we will use a larger battery whenever we're using our 100 watt radios. Um, I do have this solar panel. And I have to admit, I haven't used it very much because I find the batteries that we've taken with us last through the day. But there are folks who do go out for multiple day activations and, and they find it necessary to top up their batteries with uh, solar panels. And then um, again, on the, some of the YouTube videos, you see guys have made um, uh, little power packs uh, out of these ammo cans. This is a... Um, uh, an ammo can that I got from um, Harbor Freight for about eight bucks, and um, and made a um, uh, made this device that I'll show you a little bit more about it in just a second. Uh, this little battery, bioenergy anno battery, a lithium um, iron phosphate uh, chemistry battery. These are really nice batteries because um, uh, weight for weight, um, they they give you um, when when it says it's four four and a half amp hours, you get four and a half amp hours out of it. They charge rapidly. They're a little bit more. They're they're more expensive than um, uh, AGM batteries. But um, again, when when you buy an AGM battery that's four and a half amps, you can really only run it down about uh, two and a half amps, and then you need to stop or you'll ruin it. So, uh, weight for weight and size for size, we we find that the BioNO batteries are really the the best option for us. And this particular battery is uh, let's see, it's about fifty four watt hours. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit air earlier, I put this in my bag with my QRP rig and I took it through the TSA without any problems. They didn't even want to know what was inside my bag. And so, uh, and, and the, the TSA, the uh, law allows you to carry battery about twice the size. So you can go up to a hundred watt hours, um, uh, with one of these batteries, um, uh, legally. And again, as long as the airlines agree, but anyway, this battery is what I use for my QRP work and, uh, it works really fine. Um, this is my little ammo box power supply. Um, I, I got the plans for doing this from a guy who's real active on YouTube. And uh, it, it's pretty much overkill. If I had to do this again, I would say that I would do, do it uh, much more simply. Uh, the things that really important is to have a way to get access to the battery that's inside the box. This is uh, one of these little power works things that you can, you can get from a number of different places. HRO has them. Um, I got this uh, meter from Amazon. Um, again, it has way more information than it's turned out that I've ever used. What I've learned in our operations is that my my battery that I'll show you in a minute completely lasts through the day. So I, I don't end up needing to pay attention too much to this, but it's there if I need it. And then the other thing that's really useful are these um, these plugs here. Again, they're readily available from Amazon. This particular one has... Um, uh, two outputs on it. It has the, uh, the, the standard USB, uh, in, in this case, version three, but you, you can use your version two, version three USB plugs. It also has a USB-C on it so that if you're using a new iPad, for example, or like my laptop, for example, um, has a, I have a USB-C plug that I, I can plug in here and it'll keep my laptop charged up from this. And so, so it works really well. Um, as I said, I got this box at Harbor Freight on sale for eight bucks, and um, it was real easy to drill the holes in the side to uh, mount the gadgetry here. And then the other thing that I used that uh, was really helpful were these um, these connectors called. They're made by a company called, or their brand name is Wagu W A G O. And uh, these little orange levers pop up, and you can strip the wire and just push the wire in and drop the lever down. And you can use this to make multiple connections. So you can see that I use these throughout the box. Uh, this is a 30 amp hour BioNO um, lithium phosphate battery, iron phosphate battery. It has not even come close to running down on any of the days that we've been operating. Um, I have protected the system with fuses, so I have a fuse both in the negative line and the positive line. That fuse is down there. 
And then um, you'll see here I have um, solar in and power in and battery out. And the way I manage that is to um, use one of these West Mountain Radio Epic power gates so that if I do choose to use the solar panel someday, uh, it plugs in here. And then if I want to charge my battery from a 12 volt power supply, I can I can charge it from here and uh, it otherwise manages the um, the power inside the uh, inside the box. So this whole system for me works out uh, pretty well. Um, and as I mentioned, the um, uh, you can use solar panels if you want. Um, there, there are some folks who really advocate using these things. I, I just haven't been out long enough uh, away from power uh, that, that I've needed to use them, but, but they're available. These power film um, uh, solar panels are really interesting. They're, they're weatherproof, and you can lay them out on the table, and they're easy to carry, but they're pretty expensive. Um, also, you can use these uh, microcrystalline um, solar panels, and um, they're they're again readily available uh, and uh, much uh, a much lower cost than than these. So it just it's just a matter of how much stuff you want to carry uh, with you. Another thing that's really important is logging, um, and it's it's up to the activator, as I said, to make this whole system work. If the activators don't submit their logs. The chasers don't get credit, and then the whole system falls apart. So it's really important for the um, activators to be logging. And um, there's a couple ways to do it. I, I see people uh, advising to keep it simple and keep it lightweight and log with paper. Um, I tried it once, and I decided I was never going to do it again because I had to come home and copy all the QSOs into a logger because I needed the, to, to create the ADI file. And... For me, it just wasn't worth the hassle to write it down on paper and then to recopy it uh, into um, the to to the data into a logging database that I could then get the AD5, uh, ADF, ADIF file out of. So um, I'm now using uh, an app that has uh, recently become available that is lovingly known as Hammers H A M R S. It is a free app that is available, been made available by by its authors who are, originally did this for soda, as I understand it. Summit's on the air, but uh, it they have a you can set up a log for parks on the air, and this thing is really easy to use. Um, and when you when you set it up, you you operate it, you enter their call signs and the signal reports, and then there's a a, a field here to put the park in. And it's very straightforward to use. The one downside to it is, is that there's no communication between hammers and radios. So one of the mistakes I've made is to, if I've changed bands, I, I really need to remember to update the frequency and or the band I'm operating on because that's one of the pieces of information that you have to submit. And I've had a couple of situations where I've forgotten to do that. And then I got to go back and figure out, well, when did I change bands and which guys went where? So that's just one caution with this piece of software. And then again, the things that are really nice about it is that um, you can see who you've contacted and and where where they're where they're at and so forth, and also the number of QSOs. And when you hit the magic ten, you know you've activated, and then you can you can just go from there. But another nice feature that this um, uh, app has is that if you um, uh, have internet access, like for example, with a with a hotspot on your phone, uh, it has this page where it ties into the um, Parks on the air system, and it will show you uh, where who, who also is working. And so, if if you want to find parks that you want to activate in the in the whole park to park situation, you can uh, tune up and down the band and find them. And then, if you find a station you can hear and you can work them, you just hit the little copy button here, and it takes all of their information and populates the fields up here. So it makes park to park uh, contacts and logging just like crazy easy. And uh, so, so for for the park to parks, uh, or so for the parks on the air, uh, this logging software works really great. And then the last thing that it does, uh, and you've seen some examples of this, as you make your QSOs, um, it builds this map for you, which is kind of fun um, to to see who you've talked to um, after you've activated a park. So, um, I highly recommend uh, using Hammers. Um, N1MM has a parks on the air. Um, 
uh, set up that, that you can use as well. And of course, you know, the advantage of N1MM is that it'll talk to the radio. So, uh, you don't have to worry about when you change bands to, to remember to make those changes. But, uh, hammers is so easy and so well designed for parks on the air that, um, I, I wouldn't recommend using anything else. So uh, that's the story on logging. So, so that pretty much covers it for how to activate. You need a radio, you need power, you need an antenna, and you need to have a way to, to um, make logs. And so then what do you do when you get out to the parks? Well, the story there is, is that every park is different. And again, that's one of the real joys of all this, besides going out and communing with nature and seeing all the beautiful things that you've seen. Um, rolling into these parks, uh, again, you never know what you're going to get when you get there. And um, so um, our, our experience so far has been that um, a lot of parks have picnic tables and the picnic tables are surrounded by trees. And if you're lucky, you can set yourself up so you're not too close to people who are always very curious about what you're up to. Uh, and you can set these up. So uh, if you got a picnic table, the, uh, the one trip rule um, easily applies. We can take our stuff out to the picnic table and we can get it set up. We throw the line up in the tree and uh, we're off and running. And I would say usually about 15 or 20 minutes, we can walk into a place, throw up the antenna line and get it, get it up and working. Um, we've also been in situations where we found covered quarters. This is the Manassas Battlefield Park. So uh, we rolled into here and we have this nice pavilion. There wasn't anybody there. So we uh, put the um, put the mast up in the tree like I showed you a little bit earlier and set up on the picnic tables. And it just so happened on this day, it was pretty breezy. So it was nice to be uh, underneath the shelter and kind of hidden by the walls so that uh, we weren't blown around quite so much. So So that was very helpful. Um, we've also been in situations where the only thing we can find is like a park bench. So in this case, we, we found this bench and we had this little portable table. I showed it to you a little bit earlier. And um, between the two of us and, and our laps and the park bench, we we're able to sit up, set up there and, excuse me, have a nice little operation. And then we've been in situations where there's nothing. <laughs> and so we just set up a table in the parking lot and uh, put the antenna in a tree nearby and uh, just just operated uh, next to the cars in the park like this. And then uh, this was a situation in Texas. I was in a rental car. I didn't have any trailers. There were no picnic tables. So uh, what I did was I uh, put the antenna up and I looped it over the uh, the scrub here and um, uh, ran the um, the feed line uh, to the car. And I just sat in the back seat. I opened up the door. I put the driver's seat all the way forward and I sat in the back seat and I ran uh, CW with my KX2 from this park. And again, it took me a while, but uh, I managed to get my 10 QSOs and, and got the park activated. We were there late in the day and the park was going to close and, and we I finished up the the activation just within about a half an hour of closing so um, again interesting experience and in, in being efficient and, and and hoping i got enough qso's to to make the activation a good one so uh you know again it's it's uh, not only fun to get out and do the radios but it's it's really fun to kind of deal with the uh the challenges that the uh, that the parks deliver um, okay, so this is the last section of the presentation. Just a few things to kind of uh, just this and that to, to talk about here. So um, if you're going to activate a park, it's really a good idea to schedule your activations. And again, you can do this on the Parks on the Air website. The big advantage, well, there's two advantages of activating. One is, is it helps the hunters know whenever you're going to be out there. And, um, you know, they'll be looking for you. And that's important whenever you're in a place where you're so out in the boondocks that um, uh, you don't have cell phone connection and you can't spot yourself. Spotting is really important because as soon as you spot yourself, people come looking for you, and uh, that's when the pileups happen. So this whole spotting system is really important. And um, so anything you can do to help yourself, uh, help the, the hunters find you and so that they in turn can spot you is a good thing. The other thing is, is that if you're operating digitally or with CW, if you put yourself in the schedule, and then when you get out to the park and you start calling CQ POTA and your call sign, um, there's a tie up between the reverse beacon network and the parks on the air uh, spotting system. So that as soon as you start calling CQ and if, when a reverse beacon network station picks you up, it automatically spots you. And so so that's really good as well. And that doesn't happen unless you um, indicate unless you schedule yourself. So that's that's really an important thing to, to try to do. 
Um, the other thing is, is that um, it's really useful to uh, have something with you to 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 identify yourself. Um, there, there are. You'd be surprised how maybe not, but but people are curious when they see you set up out in the parks. They want to know who you are and what you're doing, and uh, even more importantly, the park rangers sometimes get fairly curious about what you're doing as well. And so, um, I carry this badge. Mike has one very much like it, and uh, we try to give ourselves some some degree of officialdom when we're out there, and we say, "Hey, we're from this group called Parks on the Air, and we're amateur radio operators, and you know, we're going to pick up all of our stuff, and we're good." citizens, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I don't show it here, but I also keep a copy of my FCC license uh, in my bag in case anybody has any questions. I, it's laminated and uh, it's always there with me just to, um, again, uh, give me as much, so to speak, official status as I can get uh, in, just in case there's questions about what we're up to. The other thing that's really important to think about is kind of, um, I'll put this in the bracket of safety. Um, when I was in Texas, for example, I was so glad I had a bottle of off along with me because when I first set up, the bugs were just eating me up. I was um, uh, just itching myself to death, and the uh, the deep woods off was an immediate cure for that. So, of course, you know, when you get out in the woods, there's a lot of insects, and um, so it's a good idea to have insect repellent. And sometimes there's shade, and sometimes there's not. So um, if it's bright and sunny, it's a good idea to have some sunscreen along with and then the other thing is, is that um, some of these parks have absolutely no amenities, no water, no anything. So it's always a good idea to bring water to keep yourself hydrated and then uh, a few snacks just to give you a little bit of energy. And, of course, you know, you can pack a lunch and that sort of thing. But it, it's good to, to take care of yourself in that way. So um, and then just to tie it all up here, uh, I mentioned that hunters uh, can earn awards. Well, it's the same thing for the activators. And I'll show you a couple that... Um, uh, we've earned so far. One one I like in particular is called the Radar Award, and there's different levels of Radar Award you can achieve. Radar is an acronym for Rapid Deployment of Amateur Radio, and again, you know, sort of this is in the spirit of being able to take your stuff out, set it up, and then take it down, and then move on to another park. So these Radar Awards are for are given for you when you activate more than one park uh, within a 24 hour period. So, uh, and, and whoever came up with this thought it would be fun to name these awards after animals. So uh, the, the one of the awards that we have is the, it, this is the rhino level, and this is for activating three parks uh, that are separated by a minimum distance within, within a 24 hour period. So uh, you can see the park numbers that, that we activated and um, you fill out a little form and again, it's all automatic. As soon as you fill out the form, you get the certificate back and uh, it's kind of fun. And Mike and I are plotting our uh, next Rhino award. We're going to go for five parks in one day and uh, we'll see what we can do after that. But anyway, those are the kinds of things that are a little bit fun to do. Um, here's another award that we have for working park to park stations. In this case, I, I got this one uh, for working 75 uh, other parks while I was activating a park. So um, that's kind of fun. We um, uh, look forward to finding the other parks out there. And um, so there's awards for that. And there's just tons and tons and tons of other awards that um, I don't have time to talk about now. You can see them all on the website. But uh, it's one of the things that um, uh, makes this fun as well. There's a lot of information out there if you want to learn more. The Parks on the Air website is just a treasure trove of information. They got tutorials, they got videos, they've got uh, you know the logins, the records, and all that sort of stuff. So, and I can't again, I can't say enough about what a great job those folks have done putting all that together. There's some YouTube channels that um, where guys focus on Parks on the Air. Um, K8 MRD st uh, radio stuff is a pretty good one. Um, I like this one. The, the, this gentleman's call sign is K4SWL, and he has a website called QRP, Q, QRPR.com. And uh, he's always testing radios, antennas, and, and talking about his activations, and I find his uh, videos interesting. Uh, K9 VBR is the J-Pole antenna guy, and uh, he does a lot of park activations. And then um, 
There's a, 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 an American who's uh, living in Finland whose call sign is OH8STM uh, ham radio. He focuses on off-grid radio uh, radio operations in Finland. And, you know, he's the kind of guy who goes out in the dead of winter in Finland when the sun doesn't shine for days at a time. And uh, and, and some of his videos are, are really pretty fascinating, the kinds of things that he does. And, and, again, a lot of information on web searches and so forth. So... Um, so that's the story on our great adventures on Parks on the Air this summer. Um, I'm hope, I hope you've gathered that we've had a lot of fun doing this, and uh, I would encourage you all to give it a try because it's a lot of fun, and um, uh, we, we hope you'll give it a go. 